Welcome back everyone to my reaction to Oversimplified's The American Revolution. We're going to be doing part two today. Uh, just a touch of housekeeping before we start. Um, I have started a new series of daily shorts. They're called On This Day. Uh, it's just like 30, 40 seconds. Some are a little bit longer. Uh, it's just a fun fact about something that happened on this day in history. Uh, so that will be daily content coming out. Uh, starting from next Monday, Monday the 25th of April, we'll be having another series of shorts. These will be weekly shorts, again, around about the same length, uh, 40, 50 seconds or so, uh, called Did You Know?, which will be sort of an interesting uh, fact about history that uh, you may not already know. So it's not just the standard facts that you know most people know, it's kind of facts that are a bit more out there, you know, just fun little things like that. Um, in terms of these reaction videos, I'm hoping to keep to a schedule of getting one of these out every Friday. So um, you should be getting, uh, so there will be content every day. At the very least, you'll get a, a more long form video at least once a week. Um, I, I have set up a Patreon page. So if you want to support the channel um, as we grow, uh, you can support the channel through that. Um, I do have a an initial goal set up, which is to get to 500 a month. Um, when I when I hit that goal, I'll start to be able to I'll be able to start dedicating more time to the channel, and um, I I might be able to do a reaction video, sort of maybe once on a Wednesday and once on a Friday as well. So. Um, so yeah, so that's just a little bit of housekeeping. So uh, now that that's out of the way, let's get on with reacting to the American Revolution part two. This video was made possible by Brilliant, math and science done right. Keep watching until the end of the video to learn how you can get 20% off the annual premium subscription. Washington's butt was sufficiently kicked. Winter was here. His troops' morale was low. Some just up and left. Washington needed to do something, anything to restore faith in the revolution. The British had spread throughout New Jersey and settled in for a winter of drinking cider and partying hard. Nobody. <laughs> That's not that far from the truth either. Um, now, one thing I often see people commenting on when it comes to uh, this part of the campaign is why did the British sp split their forces up so much? Because that's like the common uh, military maxim. You don't divide your troops. It exposes you to defeat in detail because if the enemy keeps their army in one place and all together, if you split your troops up, they can just defeat each garrison individually. But the huge, huge problem that the British faced during the American Revolution was a problem of supply. And they had to contend with um, a population that was either largely ambivalent or largely hostile. Only about 20% of the entire American population were out-and-out -out supporters of the crown during this time. Most didn't care. Only about 30, about 35% to 40% were uh, patriots. So the bulk of the population, you know, they, they were sort of either way. So um, the British couldn't just really steal from the population because if they did, they risked driving them into the hands of the patriots, which is what happened in quite a lot of cases. Um, so... Because America is also so sparsely populated, it means that there's very little uh, developed infrastructure for transporting supplies from uh, the ports, which is where the vast majority of British uh, supplies came from. So what they had to do was split their garrisons up and forage for supplies. Now, if you've got a lot of troops in one area, you have to throw your net really wide because you have to, you've got more troops to feed, you know. Whereas if you keep them separated, you can reduce the size of the foraging areas, which means that the garrisons are more likely to be well supplied, but they're also exposed to defeat in detail, which is what we see happen. Nobody expected an attack in the winter, so Washington started making plans for an attack in the winter. The British had hired a large force of Hessian mercenaries from the German states of Hesse Castle. Just a small point, uh, the Hessians, they were not mercenaries. So mercenary implies that it's the choice of an individual um, and they go with the person that will pay them the most money. But at, the t at this point in history, there was no such state as Germany. You know, it was, a it was the Holy Roman Empire still. And this was a collection of literally hundreds of states. Some were major powers like Prussia. Um, others were just sort of even, you know, just tiny city states, you know, but there were hundreds of these. But because they were constantly fighting each other and they had you know, the threats of Austria, they had the threat of France, they had the threat of Russia in some cases. They had to be 
almost excessively militarized. Now, one of the ways that the princes of these German states offset the economic imbalance of that was by renting their soldiers out to other states. And this was not an uncommon practice at the time. You know, um, even about 100 years earlier, during the Thirty Years' War, you had Scottish regiments fighting with the Swedish army. You know, this the concept of nationalism as we know it today hadn't really taken root yet. Um, but one thing also that we see even during the American Revolution is that the British tried to get regiments from the Netherlands. They also tried to get regiments from Russia to fight in their army without success. Um, but these Hessian troops, they were loaned out by their princes. It was the princes who got the money. But these Hessian regiments, they fought as full regiments. They fought under their own officers, uh, in their own uniforms, under their own colours. They were under overall British command, yes. Um, but they were not mercenaries. You know, these these weren't contractors out for the highest bidder. ...and Hesse Hanau to fight the rebels. It was these mercenaries that were stationed across the Delaware River from Washington and his army. And there were more Hessian reinforcements incoming, but they made an unscheduled stop because their commander got thirsty. No, not that kind of thirsty. <laughs> that kind of thirsty. Mm -hmm. It was Christmas Eve with a blizzard outside when Washington heard the Hessian defenses were down, and he decided to attack. He made a perilous crossing of the icy Delaware River with 2,400 men and marched nine miles to Trenton, where he caught the Hessian forces completely off guard. After a short but fierce battle, the Hessians surrendered in droves. It was a much-needed victory that sent a clear message, not only to the British, but to Americans across the colonies. The war was far from lost. J and that was a masterstroke on Washington's part, because contrary to popular belief, the Hessians were not drunk because it was Christmas. You know, <laughs> there are a lot of accounts from Americans who fought at this battle who said they did not see one drunken Hessian. You know, there's this popular myth that all the Hessians were drunk and that's why they were surprised. That tends to be the case when someone loses a battle or a war, they tend to make up reasons why they lost it. Of course they surprised us, surprised us. everyone was drunk, you know, how could they have not? No, wasn't the case. Um, but this march was astounding because a lot of the Continental troops didn't even have shoes. You know, there were accounts of soldiers leaving bloody footprints in the snow. And Washington crossed the Delaware, captured Trenton without losing a single man to enemy fire. You know, I think he lost like two men, but that was because of exposure. So he didn't lose a single man to enemy fire. And without Trenton, the revolution could have collapsed quite, quite easily. General Cornwallis led the British forces south to counterattack the Americans, but in a series of battles, Washington's defensive positioning and flanking maneuvers defeated the British three times in ten days, and the British decided to abandon southern New Jersey for the rest of the winter. Washington finally set up a winter camp in Morristown, but for the Americans, there was much less partying than the British. Elsewhere, the British had taken Newport, Rhode Island, because it was a good naval base. In the south, they failed to take Charleston, South Carolina, which left British loyalists unsupported and vulnerable to more harassment and even mass expulsion. Congress sent Benjamin Franklin to France on a mission to convince them to join the war, and while the French generally loved any opportunity to hoodwink the Brits, they didn't want to join unless it was a sure win. So for now, Franklin spent his days chilling out and chasing tails. The British <laughs> couldn't believe Not wrong. it wasn't over yet, and the pressure was on to end it. So the British came up with a plan. General Burgoyne in Montreal and General William Howe in New York would advance through the Hudson Valley and meet in the middle, splitting the colonies in two and thus screwing over the American communication lines. Burgoyne began his movement south, and after taking Fort Ticonderoga quite easily, he then came across heavy American resistance, so he sent Howe a dingle dongle asking if he'd be showing up anytime soon. <laughs> Meanwhile, Howe had completely nope. abandoned the plan and gone for all our personal glory by capturing the American capital, Philadelphia. He defeated. Yeah, so this campaign. Uh, so Philadelphia was the capital quote-unquote, of the United States at the time. But because the colonies had never been united before, Philadelphia didn't really hold that much strategic value. You know, unlike in Europe, when you captured the capital, you know, that was generally the end of the war, but not the case here, because Philadelphia, it was more of a symbolic capital than an actual capital, you know. Um, but yeah, this, this campaign was just so confusing, because, from a strategic point of view, because... Um, had Howe marched north and met Burgoyne, there's a very good chance the Saratoga campaign would have succeeded and Gates and his arm in the Continental Army would have been defeated and the plan would have gone would have gone through pretty well. But so but here's the thing is that Howe still could have attacked Philadelphia and captured it if he wanted to and still stayed within range of Burgoyne. You know, he could have marched overland here and captured Philadelphia, or he could have gone through the Delaware here and marched up through there and captured Philadelphia. If he had taken either of these two routes, he would have been well within range of Burgoyne to help him um, when he requested it. But instead, he takes this enormously long, circu uh, circuitous route all the way through the Chesapeake Bay, all the way up here, 
and he has to and that leaves him having to march all of this distance to capture Philadelphia and this decision was so baffling to everyone back in London that Howe's more vocal critics actually accused him of treason you know and it's 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 decisions like this when you couple it with other decisions of hesitancy earlier in the war, like at the Battle of Long Island, he could have destroyed Washington's army multiple times, never took the opportunity. Um, that eventually leads to his downfall. And there's some uh, speculation that this was just political jealousy on Howe's part because the plan to capture the Hudson Valley and split the colonies, that came from Burgoyne. So if the plan succeeded... Burgoyne gets the credit and not Howe. And, you know, at this time, generals were also politicians. You know, Howe and Burgoyne were members of parliament. So it would advance Burgoyne's political career at Howe's expense, and Howe was the commander-in-chief. So naturally, he would want some glory for himself. Now, now whether that's the whole motivation, we'll never really know. But I would say it's certainly a part Washington and his army at Brandywine Creek by using the old hit him with a decoy and flank him from behind tactic. And Philadelphia was now in British hands, forcing Congress to escape to York. But Burgoyne was left on his own to face the ever-increasing American force in Saratoga. American General Horatio Gates teamed up with our old friend Benedict Arnold to deal one final blow to Burgoyne's army. Arnold wanted to take the fight to the British, but Gates wanted to wait for the British to come to them. After a heated debate, Gates, the senior officer, told Arnold to go to his room. But Arnold defied his orders, and at the Battle of Bemis Heights, he charged at the British and obliterated them. Great. Yeah, pretty much. Um, so the Battle of Bemis Heights was a bloodbath for the British, and then they withdrew a few miles to a position that they had held weeks earlier. So they had just given up weeks of marching. And they contemplated their uh, next move. And while they were doing that, the American army just surrounded them. They just marched forward and surrounded the British position, cut them off from their supply line to Canada, and forced them to surrender. And it was this surrender that was really the turning point of the war. Great job, Horatio. By the way, what happened to that other guy who was in Saratoga? Who? Benedict Arnold. Never heard of him. Ouch. Hey, George, didn't I do a great job? No, not Take really. Delphi and all? You're fired, hmm. I bet. Didn't I? You're fired. Yep. Both Burgoyne <laughs> and Howe returned to Great Britain, leaving British General Henry Clinton to take charge of the war. And the war was about to take a nasty turn, because with the victory at Saratoga, the French were finally ready to join the Americans. All right, Benny, we're in. Hey, isn't this kind of funny, you know, because you're a republic trying to overthrow an absolute monarchy, and I'm a <laughs> monarchy helping you? Like, Foreshadowing. Like, could you imagine if your revolution inspired my people to revolt against me, and then they imprisoned me and all my family? And they chopped oh, that's never going to happen. Could you imagine? <laughs> that's called foreshadowing. Yeah. For now in America, winter was here once again, which meant yet more disease, more starvation, and even a little mutiny. After losing Philadelphia, Washington's job was again on the line. But suddenly, a Persian guy with a very fancy name, hired by Benjamin Franklin, showed up out of nowhere and said, Hey, I'm here to give your man a European military training. And train them he did. They learned how to shoot accurately, how to march in formation, where to poop and where not to, and strict punishments were handed out to any who didn't comply. What now, this this is stuff that Washington really should have been doing anyway. But, you know, sometimes you need that outside influence to just shake things up a bit. And so the, the value that Steuben brought really can't be underestimated because, sure, he most likely overinflated his position uh, back home, which a lot of these people did. Um, but the drill that he brought, he brought Prussian drill to the American army and Prussian drill for pretty much the next two, three hundred years was arguably the best drill of any army. You know, the Prussians were notoriously well drilled, especially at this time. You know, they, they had a slip up during the Napoleonic Wars where they weren't as effective anymore. But certainly at this time, if you wanted a well drilled army, you went to a Prussian drill master for sure. And, um, you know, Steuben wasn't the only um, person from, you know, because a lot, of the, a lot of the time, wars like this, they attract adventurers and they attract people, you know, just looking for personal glory. They attract people who just want to fight, you know, that, that's another thing as well. And, you know, you, so you have people like the Marquis de Lafayette, who became a close friend of Thomas Jefferson and even became a prominent leader during the French Revolution. He was one of Washington's best commanders, best field commanders. He was a Frenchman, obviously, with, with his name. And there was also a Polish um, 
man with the name of Casimir Pulaski, and he's regarded as the father of American cavalry. So he comes to America and he whips these cavalry troops into shape. Um, so, you know, wars tended to attract adventurers from all over the world at this time, but certainly the uh, the training that Steuben brought can't be understated. And when the American army left Valley Forge, it was in a much better position than when it entered Valley Forge, for sure. Um, now, the, the other thing about Valley Forge is, is it often gets portrayed as this brutal winter, and it certainly was. You know, thousands of American troops died. It wasn't the worst winter faced by the Americans. That was at Morristown. Um, but we tend to remember Valley Forge largely because of Steuben, but also because Thomas Paine wrote The American Crisis at Valley Forge, which begins with the famous lines, these are the times that try men's souls. So if you've heard that line, that's where it comes from. Washington's army came out of the winter in 1778, a new and improved force, ready to take Philadelphia back from the British. In the end, though, they didn't have to. With the French entry into the war, the British ordered General Clinton to evacuate Philadelphia and consolidate all of the British forces in New York. So Washington sent Benedict Arnold to reoccupy and secure the city as he pursued the British through New Jersey on land, eventually finding a good opportunity to attack at Monmouth Courthouse. The battle took place on a sweltering hot summer's day, and as many soldiers died from heat stroke as they did from battle. In the end, after some incompetence slash borderline treason from Washington's second in command, it was a draw. And in this war, a draw is kind of a victory for the Americans. Yeah, and that's something that the British could never really learn particularly well throughout this entire war, which was that if the Americans won even a small battle, it often produced psychological effects that were completely disproportionate to the scale of the battle. Take Trenton, for example. I mean, that involved about 3,000 troops, three, 4,000 troops at most on both sides combined. You know, um, did it affect the overall strategic situation of the war? No, not really. Um, but it was such a stunning defeat, and it was such a complete defeat as well on the part of the Americans that f uh, defeating the Hessian garrison, that it saved the American army from collapse. You know, and so when you get even battles like Monmouth Courthouse, which is a draw, I mean, Washington did not need to fight this battle, you know, because... The British were leaving Philadelphia. Had Washington done nothing, they would have kept marching to New York, just as they would have done anyway. Um, but in a war like this, you need an example to show the people and say, look, our army stood up against the British. You know, that's what you need. But as well, even defeats could work in the Americans' favor. You know, and this is the strange psychology of wars like this. So the Battle of Germantown, which was before Valley Forge, uh, Washington tries to surprise Howe's army much the way that he had surprised the garrison at Trenton with this complicated multi-pronged attack, and it failed. But the fact that he was able to launch the attack, you know, with an army that wasn't particularly well trained, um, after having suffered strings of defeats over the previous years, that alone was enough to impress the French, because they thought, wow under any, any other army, under any other commander, would have fallen apart, but not this one. Next up, let's talk about this guy. This is John Paul Jones. John Paul Jones is handsome, Scottish, and absolutely insane. <laughs> when the war first broke out, everyone was like, How not wrong. <laughs> to stand up to the might of the British Navy with their meager fleet of converted merchantmen. Yep, try telling that to John Paul Jones. <laughs> this guy sailed to the British Isles, somehow captured a British ship off the coast of Ireland, and brought it back to France. Then he returned, attacking more ships, raiding towns, and evading capture the entire time. These are basically pirate tactics, but hey, if it works, it works. In one incident, he captured a British ship and returned to a Dutch port without an official ensign because his was lost during the battle. That's a big no-no and can have you arrested as a pirate. The Dutch helped him out by quickly creating a design based on Benjamin Franklin's description of what the American flag should look like, and they entered it into their records as an official US looks flag. Cool. What they came up with looks pretty cool. The whole yeah. campaign probably played heavily on British morale and brought into question their ability to win the war. And fun fact, he was so cool that one of the towns he raided in 1778 gave him an official honorary pardon in 1999. Keep ripping in heaven, John Paul <laughs> <laughs> You're an angel now. What the continent? Yeah, so John Paul Jones was like the first American naval hero. And, you know, there's there's even a lot about him in, in England, actually, because the town... So this might have been the one that he was just alluding to when he captured the ship off the coast of England here. But along this part of the English coast, you've got towns like Whitby, Scarborough, and especially Bridlington. But there was a particularly vicious battle that he fought off Flamborough Head, which is like this sort of piece of cliff that sort of juts out into the sea just here and 
the Royal Navy, there was the HMS Serapis and the Countess of Scarborough, and they were escorting a trade fleet coming from Scandinavia up here because that's where Britain got most of its timber to build ships. And they were escorting this convoy. John Paul Jones leads a squadron of French and American ships. He's in um, the ship, the Bonham Richard, and they engage the Royal Navy off the coast of, off the coast of England here. The Royal Navy loses uh, th their ships, but also the Bonham Richard is so badly damaged they have to abandon it the next day. And that might have been the battle that he was referring to. But um, there's also a famous quote where um, the British commander thought that John Paul Jones had surrendered his ship by striking his colours, which usually meant that you take down your ensign and or hoist up a white flag of surrender. And it was kind of like a sarcastic comment, you know, he's like, oh, have you surrendered already? You know, and John Paul Jones just replies, I have not yet begun to fight, <laughs> you know. Um, but if you go to these towns here today, there's actually a lot around there about this guy, you know, and it's, it's quite striking, really. The Continental Navy was lacking in resources, though. The French entry into the war made up for. The French began with naval skirmishes in the English Channel, and they sent a large fleet to America, although it sustained a lot of damage in a storm off Rhode Island. The Americans were hoping for a bigger commitment from the French, so John Adams went to France to help Benjamin Franklin continue negotiations. Oh good, you're finally here. Check this out. Hey ladies, I'd like to fly you like a kid, because you're electrifying. Oh god. Isn't this great? Is this? Is this what you've been doing? Yeah. Why? We were sent here on a diplomatic mission to secure military support from France, not to philander with the locals. Wait, no, ladies, come back. <sighs> Worst wingman <laughs> ever. But the American... Yeah, they had very different styles of diplomacy. So John Adams was very much a tell-it-like-it-is kind of guy. Didn't make him any friends, uh, particularly throughout the rest of his career, and especially when he became president. Uh, ben Franklin was very much a when in Rome kind of guy. You know, he was more about building relationships, uh, friendships and that kind of thing. And that's that actually did serve him much better, especially in places like France. And that's something that uh, Adams could never really kind of come to grips with. Um, he was much more at home in places like the Netherlands and in London, whereas Franklin and Jefferson were much more at home in France would get some more help. The Dutch provided aid, although they never formed an official alliance. More significantly, though, the Spanish, who had already been providing aid, officially joined the war in June 1779. They would provide support in the Midwest and the Gulf Coast, campaigns that heavily impacted the Native American tribes in those areas. Both sides actually enlisted the help of Native American tribes throughout the war, sometimes even pitting those tribes against each other. In the summer of 1779, after a series of raids against the Americans by the Iroquois, Washington organized an expedition that burned down more than 40 villages, forcing the tribes to relocate to Canada for British protection. Yep, and the natives actually gave Washington the nickname uh, Town Burner because of this. And another group that shouldn't go unmentioned were African Americans, both free and enslaved. They joined both sides of the war, hoping to gain their freedom, but afterwards, Many were simply returned to slavery, particularly those who had fought for the Americans. Despite owning slaves himself, Jefferson had written a condemnation of slavery in the Declaration of Independence. But out of fear of offending the southern colonies, this was removed from the final draft. For the same reason, the American army stopped enlisting African-American men in 1775, a policy that Washington, a slave owner himself, supported. But they were forced to reverse the policy after the British promised freedom to any slaves who joined them. In general, you stood a better chance of gaining freedom if you fought for the British. However, even those that left with the British after the war suffered mistreatment and discrimination in their new lives outside of America. Our good friend Benedict... Yeah, that's all completely true. That's all completely fair as well to say. And as well, sadly, the American Revolution was the last war in which black and white soldiers fought in mixed units until um, the presidency of Truman. And that's when the army was actually desegregated. You had black units in the American Civil War, absolutely, but they fought as all black units. You know, they had white officers, sure, but they did fight as all black units. And, you know, it's it's just one of those kind of like hypocrisies, you know, over the time, you know, uh, writing these declarations for all men are created equal. And then you've got this institution as well. But maybe we'll do a video on that at some point. Dick Arnold is now in charge of Philadelphia, having a good time, partying down with, and even marrying a member of the Philadelphia elite. The same elite that had partied down with the British when they controlled the city. And suddenly, the people of Philadelphia, including the state governor, started accusing Arnold of having pro-British sentiments. To keep the people happy, Washington wrote a letter rebuking Arnold, calling his conduct imprudent and improper, and that was too many ouchies for Benedict Arnold to handle. He asked Washington to put him in charge of the fort at West Point. Then he contacted the British, offering to hand the plans of the fort over to them and join their side. 
Our good friend Benedict Arnold is our good friend no more. Luckily, the treasonous plans were discovered on a captured British officer, but Arnold managed to escape before he was arrested. As a British brigadier general, he would go on to lead raids against American cities, most notably his raid of Richmond, Virginia in 1781. His betrayal shook George Washington, who had once again set up camp at Morristown. His leadership somehow held the Continental Army together. Your the shoes look delicious. <laughs> of the war. We're entering 1780, and Parliament was hopping mad that the war still wasn't over. The British debt was soaring, and despite taking parts of Massachusetts in late 1779, the North was in a stalemate, so the British decided to make a major shift in strategy to the South, an economically rich area with a higher level of support for the British, or so the British thought. A year earlier, they had captured the underdefended city of Savannah, Georgia easily, and a joint American-French counter siege failed. Now, they laid siege to Charleston, South Carolina. It fell within months, with thousands of American troops surrendering to the British, a costly defeat. The British quickly moved to take control, and they sent stereotypical Hollywood villain with a British accent, Bannister the Butcher Tarleton, into the backcountry, where he hunted down rebels and destroyed them with ruthless brutality. The yeah, so the war in the South was much more brutal than it had been up North, and that's largely in part because the division between Patriot and Loyalist was much more stark in the South. You know, in the North, you had, like, major centers of loyalist support like New York um, but, by and large, but by and large especially in places like New England lo um, loyalist support was very minimal and but in the south it was much more closer to sort of like a 50-50 split in places so you had much more brutal violence and um, but the one problem that the British faced was that there wasn't enough loyalist support there and when British regulars tended to move out of the area the Patriot militias would quite easily overwhelm the Loyalist militias because they needed the support of the British army. And that happened repeatedly, that when the British regulars moved on, the Patriots just swallowed up all the territory that they had lost. And, you know, that's a, that's a strategy that the British could never cope with because their army was just too small. It couldn't simultaneously defeat the Americans, occupy this huge tract of land, and then also move on with enough force to engage other American armies. And that's just something that they couldn't do consistently. Um, but, yeah, so um, regarding Tarleton, so he was a very talented cavalry commander, but he was also very impetuous, as you'll no doubt see very, see very soon. Um, but you also had quite a lot of propaganda going on at this time by both sides, like this, the Wax Horse Massacre. Now, you know, there's... That's how it was portrayed by the Patriots as this bloody slaughter of Americans that were trying to surrender. Um, but when you when you dig a little deeper, you know you can see that the Loyalists thought that Tarleton had been killed, you know, while attempting to collect the the, the American surrender. So they just charged into them, you know, thinking that they had been betrayed or something. Does it excuse it? No. Um, and that's the thing about history is that we should always attempt to understand, you know. Th actions like this but we should never attempt to justify them you know or moralize them in any way the british presence also inspired local loyalist militias in the backcountry to rise up against their persecutors the british really seemed to be onto something with their new strategy and the ball was very much in washington's court i'm gonna send my most loyal general nathaniel green to the south to stop the british gonna have to overrule you there george we're sending hero of saratoga and your biggest rival horatio gates watch this george i'm gonna save the day again everybody will love me and i'm gonna get your job <laughs> yeah go. okay and he got into one battle with cornwallis got annihilated and ran away Alrighty. that's not an understatement either when they say he ran away he didn't just run you know, a few miles away, he rides over a hundred miles before giving up. And it was just a complete catastrophe because Gates's army was in hostile territory, so they had trouble with supplies, it was ridden with disease, um, so a lot of the troops were sick, and he made a huge tactical blunder, which was that he placed, he, he was a British officer by training, so he was in the British tradition of placing his best regiments on the right flank. The problem is, is that the British army were also doing that, which means their best regiments were on Gates's left flank where he placed his militia. And militia had a tendency of running away in open battle, and that's exactly what happened. The militia faced the most experienced British units. They, you know, the British had barely even fired one volley, and the entire American left flank just collapsed. And that spelled the end of the battle.
Let's go with your guy. Nathaniel Green knew the British outnumbered his own forces and wouldn't be defeated with conventional tactics, so he had to think outside the box. He split his army into two, said, hey big boy, look at me, and then they went running in two different directions. Cornwallis sent Tarleton after Morgan, and he caught up with him at Cowpens, where Morgan proceeded to kick Tarleton's butt. Yes, yeah, so these two guys, Morgan and Green, probably the most talented field commanders on either side throughout the entire war, by far. Morgan especially, Morgan had like a great grasp of tactical initiative. He knew the strengths and limitations of his own troops. He knew how to use that to his advantage. He knew how to use ground properly. Cowpens was a was just a tactical masterstroke because he he puts his army on a bend in the river, which immediately sounds disastrous because if his army's defeated, there's literally nowhere for it to run because the river's behind them. Um, but he knew that would hold his army in place. It means that the British would have a very hard time outflanking them. And Morgan's army was mostly militia. He knew that the militia would run. He knew that the British knew they would run as well. So he splits his army into three successive lines. And he just he just needs them to like fire one or two shots each and then retreat. And that's it. And he's got quite a lot of riflemen. So he orders his riflemen to shoot down the British officers, which destroys the cohesion of the British regiments. As the British charge, his successive lines withdraw, but because there's multiple lines, it means it absorbs the shock of the British charge. So by the time the British reach the American third line, they're completely all out of formation, which means they get overwhelmed pretty easily. And it was just, it was the most brilliant victory um, and the most original thought by any general on either side during the whole war. Then the two led Cornwallis on a wild chase through North Carolina. His bigger and better equipped army much heavier and slower than Green's quick and mobile troops. Green led Cornwallis further and further from his supply line, then crossed the Dan River into Virginia, picked up some reinforcements, and turned back to face the now exhausted British. At the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, the two sides engaged in vicious close combat. Cornwallis, fearing loss, fired his big guns into the chaotic fighting, cutting down many of his own men. Green retreated, giving Cornwallis the victory, but Cornwallis lost a quarter of his men in the fighting, so it felt much more like a British defeat. At this point, like I said from earlier, you know, even a British victory can feel like a defeat in this war. And the British need their troops much more than the Americans need theirs because, you know, at least in theory, because the Americans have the immediate population, the British have to ship their troops thousands of miles. And they can't really do that at this point because, you know, their lucrative sugar islands in the Caribbean are being threatened by the French and the Spanish. The British home islands are under threat of invasion. You've got war breaking out in India. So they, they just can't do this. They can't maintain the American front much longer. Both sides desperately needed something to happen soon to end the fighting. The British were running out of money, while the Americans were again facing mutinies as the men went without pay or even basic living needs. Yeah, and one thing to remember is that mutinies carried on up until the end of the war. You know, there was there was a big mutiny um, called the Conway Cabal, which tried to replace George Washington more than likely with uh, Gates, uh, which failed, obviously. Um, but there was also the Newburgh Conspiracy, and that was in 1783. You know, that was right at the end of the war, you know, um, just as the Americans were about to get their independence. But, you know, these troops, they had not been paid for years you know, they were frustrated um, and they basically said to Washington, you know, OK, either we get paid or we go home. And there's this and this is where Washington really excelled, because was Washington a good general in terms of tactical and strategic thinking? No, not really. He, he falls for the same tricks repeatedly, the same flanking maneuver over and over again in battle. He's not a very good tactician as such. Germantown was probably his best thought, but again, he vastly overestimated his own troops and the, their ability to conduct it. From a strategic sense, he proposed attacks on Boston and New York City um, before other people had to tell him, no, that's, you know, that will just lead to our own destruction, you know? So he didn't really have particularly good thoughts in those senses but where where washington excelled that no other man could have done in this uh, situation was that he was a good leader of men in that he was he knew how to motivate them he knew how to keep them together if this had been any other person the american army would have collapsed after the first few defeats they suffered washington somehow managed to keep them together and the way he defused the Newburgh conspiracy was just 
a, a masterstroke of you know just psychological manipulation, I suppose. Um, you know, he he goes he goes to a meeting of his officers. They're you know they're all sort of stood around. You know, they're not really showing him any respect because they're just annoyed they haven't been paid. And Washington starts to read a note to, to try and convince them to stay. And he kind of fumbles through his lines and he says, like, he says something to the effect of, and he, he puts on his uh, spectacles and he says something to the effect of, um, you know, please forgive me, but not only have I grown grey, but I have also grown partially blind, you know, in the service of my country. And it was just a way of saying, look how much I've given up, look how much I've sacrificed, look how much I've endured, you know, for our country. You know, and here you stand moaning about being paid while we're on the cusp of achieving our independence, you know, and it was it worked, you know, it it moved a lot of the officers to tears and they uh, reneged on their plan and the army continued. And had that, you know, had they been successful, though, things could have gone very differently. And Washington, in that, in my view, joins the ranks of people like Caesar, you know, who was also very, very good at that. He was very good at manipulating men. There was an instance in, I think it was Africa, where one of Caesar's legions threatens to mutiny over issues of pay. And they say, you know, uh, we want our pensions, you know, we want our pay, we want land. And Caesar just says, okay, then take it, take it and go home, you know, take it and go home and live with the shame that you left your commander, that you abandoned him. And, the, you know, they were so ashamed by that, that they stayed so, you know, um, it, it just showed how good Washington was at leading men. Fortunately, the French were now showing up in greater numbers and were ready to fight. After his encounter with Green, Cornwallis decided the only way to win the South was to first prevent the Southern Continental Army from using Virginia as a supply base. So he abandoned the Carolinas, moving to Wilmington and on to Yorktown, a position the British believed would be easy to supply and support. On his march to Yorktown, he raided many farms, stealing horses and supplies from the locals, but also freeing thousands of slaves, many of whom joined him. The French saw Cornwallis' new position as an opportunity to land a decisive blow on the British. Washington wanted to attack Clinton in New York, but the French said it was a really dumb idea. And to be fair, which it was. It was. Instead, yep. Washington sent out fake dispatches to make it look like they would attack Clinton, but secretly their combined force marched all the way down to Virginia. A large French fleet under the command of Comte de Grasse arrived and successfully cleared the British Navy out of the Chesapeake Bay. The combined land and naval forces then laid siege to Cornwallis's army in Yorktown. The American and French forces tightened in around the city, raining artillery down on Cornwallis. Who desperately appealed to Clinton for aid, but Clinton was unusually chilled out about the whole thing. Mm. Cornwallis held out for strangely so before he had no choice but to surrender. Over seven thousand British troops were captured, a crushing defeat, and with that, Parliament had reached the end of its rope. The war just wasn't worth it, and it needed to end <laughs> now. The British still had New York, Charleston, and Savannah, but fighting between the two sides mostly ceased as peace negotiations opened up in Paris. There was it mostly ceased, but there were still some pretty major battles going on, you know, that involved thousands of troops on either side. And nobody at the time expected that Yorktown was the end of the war. You know, Britain was opening negotiations at this point. Um, but Washington in particular thought the fighting was going to continue. And he moved his army back to New York because there was still about 20, 30,000 troops in New York City at this time. So if the British wanted to, they could have kept going. But there was just no appetite for it anymore because, you know, the Whig Party had come to power, which had opposed the war from the start. They were pushing for peace. You know, the vast majority of the British public as well at this time, they were very sympathetic with the colonists because the government was not popular and particularly their taxes. So the taxes in Britain were much, much higher than they ever were in America. So if you're in living, if, you, if you're living in Britain and you hear that half a world away, some other Brits have rebelled against the government over tax, you're going to think, well, good on them. So, you know, public support in Britain for the Americans was actually pretty high. And, you know, but at this time, there was just no appetite left for it. You know, a lot of trade came from America uh, that had completely dried up ever since the war broke out. So people just wanted it over. The resulting treaty in 1783 saw Great Britain remove its troops from American soil, recognize U.S. independence, and cede territory up to the Mississippi River. In re- yeah, so the, Amer- the Americans got much, much more than they bargained for with this treaty. So, because at the start of the war, uh, sorry, at the start of the peace negotiations, the uh, British were actually quite hesitant to offer independence as a prerequisite for peace. Um, but the, the terms of the treaty that America had with France meant that they had to negotiate together. They couldn't negotiate separate treaties of peace. 
And America just felt that France and Spain were dithering, that they were treating America as kind of a secondary partner, which they were. You know, from their perspective, that was probably a bit justified because, you know, France and Spain certainly weren't in this for any moral reason for the Americans. They were in it just to get back at the British, really. Um, so America just thought, OK, we'll bypass our allies and negotiate directly with the British. And to their surprise, the British offered them everything east of the Mississippi River. And the Americans were not expecting that. Um, but from the British perspective, what they wanted to do, because all, all of this land is arable land, it's perfect for farming. You know, it's perfect. There's, there's a lot of resources in, this, in these areas. And what the British wanted to do was to help facilitate the growth of the American population, which would create new markets that British merchants in Canada could exploit. And London didn't have to pay any administrative cost to do that. All they had to do was just send their merchants to these markets, and that's all they had to do. And what actually uh, happened was one of the French ministers said something to the effect of, um, the English don't make peace, they buy peace. <laughs> and that's, that's kind of true here. In return, the Americans agreed to pay any debt still owed to Britain and gave fair treatment to any colonists who had remained loyal to the crown. The Spanish got Florida, while the French got an economic crisis that led to its own revolution a decade later. Washington retired to his home in Mount Vernon, wishing his men farewell by saying, I most devoutly wish that your latter days may be as prosperous and happy as your former ones have been glorious and honorable. He hoped to live out the rest of his days in peace. But unfortunately for him, a number of people wanted him to be the first leader of the new country. And by everyone. a number of people, I mean literally everyone. <laughs> yeah. The first election campaign in American history was basically a grassroots effort to convince Washington to accept the office. He was sworn in on April 30th, 1789, and he himself established many of the standards and limitations of what the American leader should be. First, Sure, and again, I kind of have to wonder, did Washington really know what he was doing um, when, he went, when he was doing this? Because he was a savvy politician, you know, as we talked about in part one. Um, you know, did he really know that he was... And I have no doubt that after eight years of war, he wanted to go home. Of course, any, what anybody would. But did he know, on some level, that if he humbly refused the office, it would make people want him all the more and pretty much guarantee his victory? I don't know. You know, there's this is just conjecture on my part, but it's kind of fun to think about. And it did work, though, because this was just a huge landslide. You know, every other contender had no chance. First of all, there was debate on what he should be called. Is he a king? Is he our glorious leader? In the end, they went for a word that at the time was pretty modest. President, like the president of your local bowling club or office bake sale committee. He set up a cabinet of expert advisors knowing that no president could know everything, no matter how much of a stable genius they claimed to be. He proposed <laughs> major legislation to Congress and gave an annual State of the Union address to keep his own power in check. He stated that the U.S. should remain neutral in foreign conflicts, and in the end, he voluntarily gave up his power after just two terms. He could have made the presidency anything he wanted, but his careful and cautious actions helped set the precedent of an office that is powerful in its limitations, decisive through its diplomacy, and respected in its humility. And so the yeah, that's true. And to Washington's credit, you know, giving up the office after two terms was a smart move because he died not long after. And Washington didn't want to die in office because it would he, he feared that it would give the impression that the presidency was a lifetime appointment, that you could stay there as long as you wanted, as long as you kept getting voted in, obviously. But um, he wanted to set this precedent that there would be limits on presidential authority. And, you know, it is true. He could have made the presidency anything he wanted. Had he been more heavy handed, the United States could have looked very, very different today. Um, because a lot of the things that he did carried on just purely out of, out of tradition until quite recently. You know, um, the two-term lim limit, that wasn't actually constitutional until, I think, after FDR. So up until that point, presidents serving two terms was just doing it out of deference, really, more than anything else. Um, but, you know, th there was actually a, a push to sort of make the United States like a crowned republic in a sense where, you know, it would have been like the uh, Commonwealth of England after the English Civil War, where Cromwell was basically a monarch in all but name. Um, had Washington accepted that, they would have gone for it. You know, they would, they would have easily have made Washington a king. Um, but to his credit, he didn't. The United States was born and everything was perfect. It had no problems. Not a single one. Certainly nothing that would, I don't know, cause such an extreme divide that it would lead to a civil war. <laughs> anyway, moving on. 
Quick quiz. Name the most American thing you can think of. Baseball? Bowl. Okay, I guess that's the end. So, yeah. Um, it's a great miniseries, um, what Oversimplified did with the American Revolution. And uh, go check out their channel. Um, give them a subscribe. They do, they do some great work. Um, you know, just all the work that goes into their videos is just astonishing, really. Um, but, yeah, so make sure you check them out. Um, check out the other videos that I've got uploaded on the channel. Um, as I say, there's going to be content coming out daily, so make sure that you stick around for that. Make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss anything, and I will see you on the next one.